Continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Barbara Tian. Barbara is the co-founder of Ponga.com and has always been passionate about family history, stories, and photographs. After a career in two high-growth networking companies, she co-founded Ponga to focus on sharing stories privately in pictures. Ponga is all about your stories. Sharing privately in pictures, it's a software service that runs on your browser and lets you organize your pictures quickly and easily so that you can use them to privately share stories with family and friends. Individually or combined into albums, Ponga pictures are all private and shared only by invitation. Wrapped in context and shared as private links, Ponga pictures become like platters passed around a family to put stories back into circulation. By giving you access to the visual context of photographs, Ponga creates a new way to use pictures to capture research, crowdsource memories, and curate your family legacy for future generations. So without further ado, I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Barbara. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Suzanne. This is just such a wonderful um, community that you've built here. Um, and I've spent a little bit of time since we met uh, getting to know you and uh, uh, now in the early part here of this session, uh, having a chance to chat with so many of you about the work that you're doing and really the reach that you now have across the country um, with uh, not only your specific work, but also the work that you're doing in creating a model model that other uh, libraries of excellence can really start to uh, can really start to to recognize and copy and try to do the same kinds of things in their own communities so I'm here as a co-founder of a small startup in Berkeley California and uh, I imagine that for most of you this is the first time you've ever heard of Ponga we totally understand we're a startup and we just released our first uh, software in uh, at Roots Tech 2021 so we've been in the market it for not even a year yet. So I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what we do and how we do it. And with that, I'm going to switch to my um, uh, to my presentation here. There we go. So you should see here um, my slides. So as I said, um, we're a little tiny startup here in Berkeley, California, and um, we are uh, uh, building a way that lets you do kind of what you always did in real life, where you would um, sit with someone and talk about objects, walk your way through a, an album, an old photo album. What do you do? You share those stories. Those are the stories that matter. And as we see it, family historians and genealogists have a very special place to play in this process because you have a unique way of understanding the power of those stories. The photographs and albums, they are like a treasure trove of what we have and, and uh, how we go about it. Digitizing them not only creates a backup, but it also an opportunity to understand them in context. Because modern technologies have given us a way of connecting directly to the details in those images. And that's what we are building here at Ponga. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that have leveraged networked intelligence and resources in things like digital cameras and scanners and ways to restore images and handle all of that uh, uh, updating of images or store images out on the cloud with uh, cloud storage and printing of books and artifacts. We're doing uh, digital storytelling. From our perspective, the opportunity is to um, really have a way that you can share those private, uh, those private stories and keep them private. Um, control that. So we started using um, uh, these advanced technologies like artificial intelligence. So. Um, uh, we've leveraged artificial intelligence to detect and collect faces so that you can quickly organize and label your photos, then explore them in context. Who was there? What was the occasion? What was the story behind it? And then you can tell a story. You can use them to capture research or share them privately to capture crowdsource stories or pull those stories you you collect to start curating a digital shared legacy. 
And we talked a little bit about this before we got started here on the call, because really there are so many levels of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Are you doing it just for yourself? Are you doing it to share with your immediate family, with your children, with your grandchildren? Are you doing it to capture what you experienced? We were talking about how this COVID pandemic is probably most like the Spanish flu back in um, uh, 1918 and 17 and 18, and yet it's not like anything the world has ever seen. And what will the world see in the future? How will we tell those stories? We believe that that's something that's a real responsibility here. So as we go through what my, my, my planned remarks here, I want to show you how we use photos to connect artifacts and heirlooms and photographs to the stories, the historical context, and in the process, add color to your own family stories, those names and dates and births and locations and relationships that you've collected as part of your genealogy. You're, you've got the stories too. We're creating a way that releases you to tell those stories and connect to it perhaps the documents that you have that are the evidence of what you know, to add the color of what you surmise but aren't sure of, to create in part perhaps the cookie crumbs that future genealogists can follow and research. And we believe that uh, we need to leverage all of the possible tools out there on the on the internet to make that possible, including the kinds of uh, databases, um, Suzanne, that you talked about making available, but also tools like permanent.org. We refer to that quite a bit in this presentation because we think of it as a wonderful partner to be able to store, permanently store your artifacts and to your point about free resources. Ponga has a uh, partnership with Permanent, which by the way is a nonprofit funded by the likes of Mozilla Foundation. Um, their model is endowment. You pay once up front and then it's permanently kept. You just, just the one payment. In partnership with Ponga, all Ponga um, members, their guests and friends have access to two gigabytes of free storage out at Permanent. The neat thing is you can link right into your Ponga pictures from the documents that you store in Permanent, and that's why we talk about it. And together we're weaving a narrative through objects that will, as I said, inspire the next generation through the lived history of their ancestors. That would be you and me. So. A word about privacy, because I know that's super important in the genealogy space for no other reason, at least, because it relates to information that can be used for fraud. It also relates to sensitive information like um, out of wedlock births or uh, second marriages or things that grandmother didn't approve of that we believe the, the individual has the right, the living individuals have the right to decide what happens with their story, their information. These are the kinds of things that are stories that are told on the sofa, not on the stage. And so much of media and sharing environment today is on a public town square. That's fine for those kinds of things. And frankly, we use that too for our own marketing materials. But when it comes to your private stories, what did grandmother mean when she said that time I spent in Texas? What is that all about? Having the privacy to tell those real stories, we believe is the only way that those stories can be real. And we can talk about that in the discussion as well. So obviously, for many of us, think of digitizing artifacts and photographs to start with for the purpose of protecting them. Here in California, uh, wildfires are never far away. I'm in Berkeley, California. When we moved into our home here in what we call the flatlands in Berkeley, um, it was just two months later that the uh, Oakland Hills, the Berkeley Hills fire, East Bay Hills fire uh, took place. It destroyed 1,400 homes just, you know, a mile and a half from here. And um, I was home with a brand new baby at the time and uh, full of the hormones that come along with all of that. Was we watched many of the homes that we looked at just burn to the ground um, and feel very lucky to that and, and have the opportunity to protect so many of these artifacts that were passed down in my own family. So to the personal connection to all of this, um, I feel very fortunate to have um, 
to have inherited through my great aunts and other people that saw I had a little more interest in technology than the average bear, that um, <laughs> they would send them all to me. So I I've collected a lot of these. Uh, but my grandmother was a genealogist, an amateur genealogist, but produced a uh, a book, you know, one of these uh, family history books. Um, oh, you can't see me. Um, and uh, photographs. I have many of the photographs like this one here that are part of our uh, our collection all came from uh, the materials that she collected and passed on. I feel, as so many of you do, that I've got that kind of responsibility to it. Um, and I also have those objects, my own teddy bear. It's just a bear. It's just an ordinary thing. But in many ways, reflecting back on it <clears throat> 100 years later, it's the rubbed off. It's the skin horse of the velveteen rabbit. It's the stories behind that, what happened to the time when the, the stitches were done. Again, being able to do these as photographs of objects or photographs of objects that are traditional storytelling devices, like the American uh, quilting tradition that uh, you see across, especially across the American Midwest, many of these uh, traditions came in with Quakers and Protestants, many of the uh, early immigrants to this country telling their story in quilts. This is a particularly interesting one we'll be talking about some more. Um, the fundamental idea is to connect the photographs and documents you've collected in your research to bring your stories to life. That's really what we're all about. And maybe this is a good place to um, stop the screen sharing, hi, um, and move on to the, um, to the actual software. So I'm going to share a different screen now. Um, and this one is of the actual software. So let's go over there. So what you see here is actually the Ponga um, user interface. We call this a library, surprise, where all of your photos are collected. You have some pictures shared with me. You select those and you'll see those. Down on the left here, you see albums by person. Al sorting albums, sorting your photographs by people is really, really useful. But in order to do that, you obviously have a lot of pictures with multiple people in them. And if you'll remember the days of uh, handling your email and sorting them all into folders so you could keep track of who you were talking to, it gets really difficult. Uh, when Gmail was introduced, one of the mind-bending things that they did was to say, forget files, you're talking to the web. These are links, and that's what we do with Ponga. I used to have a handy um, <laughs> uh, thumb drive. Imagine I'm holding a thumb drive here, or even, uh, oh, you can't see me, even a print. Um, as you have these files, we take the files that you upload into Ponga, and we make a working copy. We take your original file, and we put it away. So if that original file um, were, in fact, why don't we go ahead and do that? Let me upload an image here. I, you can't see my selecting uh, from a local drive here offline, but I have just dragged. We're going to make it short for now so that it's uh, easier to just be done. Um, I've dragged in an image. While we do that, we are capturing that original image, which can be JPEG, PNG, or TIFF file of any size. Don't even worry about it. Um, we make a copy of it and turn it into a URL, a web link. That original file might be a 40 meg TIFF file with heavily curated metadata that has people names in it and all kinds of things. Don't worry about it. It's protected because we're not touching it after we made a copy. The copy we made, we do some fancy processing on it so that we can zoom in and out of a very high resolution image quickly and easily. And I'll show you that. And then we allow you to add selections on any detail in the image so that you can add stories to it. We also go through using advanced um, artificial intelligence, computer vision, and mostly machine learning to examine every image looking for the distinct human pattern of faces. Then we apply that technology to um, group the faces that appear to be the same person and present them to you in a gallery. And I'm going to wait for a moment to do that because that takes just a, a minute 
about two to three minutes to happen for each picture or set of pictures or batch of pictures that I upload, about the same for all of them. Um, but while that happens, I'm going to show you how you can attach content to a picture. So here's a picture that actually comes as a as a sample in every account. This is your own playground. Um, and uh, a word for a moment about how our accounts work. So Ponga is a subscription service that allows our members to upload pictures, do this magic sorting of faces, and then add stories to it and share privately with anyone they like as their free guest. Free guest is really important because they're a guest, you invite them, they can't see your picture unless you invite them. And in that way, it's entirely private. Remember, I said it's a link. So it's an access controlled from that link. You can, bam, delete their comments. You can remove, revoke their invitation to it if you want to. They don't retain any access as if they had downloaded a picture from Facebook, for example. Also, when you upload your pictures to Ponga, you own your pictures. We do not. That's really important. And many of you know, for example, as um, uh, Ancestry caused a bit of a scandal recently when they just updated their terms of service and people realized, hey, wait a minute, they own, they have the right to redistribute my pictures even after I delete my account. We don't do that. You own your pictures. When you share it, you're sharing it with them. If you ask us to delete it, we'll delete your entire account. And by the way, as described in our terms of service, um, if you have been a member this year but want to pause for a while and come back later, we will pause your account and you become a guest on your own account. You can't upload more pictures. You can't share more pictures. You can't do the sorting. But it's OK. Your pictures are still there and they're still private. So that's a really important distinction and concept. So in terms of the free things you can do, I can invite you, and I'll be delighted to invite as many, anyone who would like, just drop me an email to barbara at ponga.com, and I added that into the chat. And you can pop that back in again if you'd like, uh, Suzanne, so everyone else uh, can see that. But I'm delighted to invite you to one of the pictures that I'm going to give you as an example. When you do that, you get this picture dropped into your own account. That's actually a picture from right here um, uh, of some of my own family pictures and heirlooms. And I put this together really to give people an example of the kinds of things that can be added into a picture. So uh, you see a lot of little boxes here. You can make the boxes show and hide, right? So you can see where they are. And even when they're hidden, when you mouse over them, content appears. So. Uh, when I click on a selection, notice it turns orange and the sidebar appears. I'm going to hide the uh, chat there. Um, and the sidebar can include all this other content. In this case, this is a book, right? Oh, by the way, I mentioned zooming in. So this is only about an 8, eight meg file, not that big. But as you can see, I can zoom in to a lot of detail on it and also uh, zoom back out very, very quickly. And I can do that because we tile the image um, so that you can see the details and get really into it. In this case, it's a book that was published in, I think, the 19, early, early 20th century. Um, and the, it's a collection of essays, actually. And it turns out the book is long out of print, but it's um, available through um, Google Books. So here I can go to the actual book over in Google Books and if I wanted, you know, I'm using this picture to share actually with our members and guests as well. And you can scan through the actual story. And that ability to connect documents and materials is just fabulously powerful. So that's a book. Well, yeah, you can also add text. So here is just a little comment and has a link um, added right into it. And this one is a video. So notice the video plays. You all know TED Talks. Um, Ladies any, and gentlemen, gather any Germany. Any there kind of video time, that you want to, any kind of content that you want to bring in to tell your story, you can bring in. Period. There are links on the web, like Ancestry or Family Search, that are access controlled. Right? You have to log in to be able to see the content. So we can't embed that content the way we do video. What you can do is include a link the way I have here, just without the, 
the protocol designator HTTPS blah 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 uh, just take that part off and it auto links so that you can always get to that kind of content and go straight to it but media like uh, sound this is SoundCloud um, is automatically brought in and embedded because frankly that technology is designed using web standards that are meant to be embedded on websites so the media just plays so this is a podcast called the wisdom to quote project. the great Jimi hendrix all right this is a podcast called the wisdom project about veteran stories uh, remembering the um, d-day invasion so there's a lot of that kind of content that's out there perhaps it's your ancestors that are uh, quoted and linked this is so much more alive than just popping in a URL and and that's essentially the idea earlier in our conversation um, Suzanne you mentioned a uh, story core so I thought gee let's go find out how that works so here is a story in story core I copied the link went back into the picture that's the that's the uh, Julia child after here's how you paste it in now if I just paste the link that's what I get if I paste um, uh, Suzanne you mentioned this was this the article you were referring to for example now if I include all of that that's what I get in the post with my content um, if I don't include the HTTPS then I just get the link um, so you can have the link you can have the content you're in control of how that content appears whatever the first comment was in a selection is what previews um, so I've shown you uh, a variety of different kind of media in this picture but uh, what's more fun is let me pop over to one of my favorite examples uh, and is it in oh shared with me there we go this is a picture that's actually owned by someone else so this picture is one I've been invited to it's owned by <clears throat> my alter ego Audi here at Punga and it's a picture that has um, a whole lot of different examples in it you'll see up here there is a title and a description when you upload your pictures the um, uh, we take the whatever the name of the file was we turn that into the title you can change it uh, this is but other people that you're sharing with can't change it you control it right um, here is a description of it uh, probably taken in about 1918 about the same time as the Spanish flu but I have no reference to what was happening in the Spanish flu and then there's also a link right there that clicking it it takes me to an article that's all about this this is the picture I'd be delighted to invite you to and it gives you procedural information about how each of the different kinds of media are added into a Ponga picture oh did you notice that these are the faces of people in the picture and um, uh, they have been sorted into albums uh, in Audi's account and here I can see who they are I can see their names again I can see media like video this is my great-grandfather he was um, out in Abilene Kansas along the Chisholm Trail and here is a That's video a historic Chisholm Trail no. that gives a little sense of color about that um, and one of the most interesting things down here um, here is my grandmother and as I mentioned earlier she wrote that family history book here's the book I posted the book into permanent.org and you see the link to the book itself so you can go over to the actual file and go through this and by the way <laughs> as genealogists I know how sensitive you are and how respectful you are of the information about living people we fully agree uh, my grandmother passed away many years ago um, but there are people this book was published in 1939 there are people who are in this book who are still living so I simply um, I've simply went through and abridged the book to what I share publicly here for just that reason you're welcome to do the same kind of thing another thing that you can do is add content like dragging in a photo so here is what looks like a cameo we can even zoom in further 
don't know if we can get, no, can't get any closer than that. And the resolution you can get to depends on the resolution of the original image. But I believe that she is wearing a cameo that is a cameo that my mother gave me and I've given to my daughter, who was kind enough to let me take a picture of it and keep it for safekeeping here. And here it is associated with that uh, item in the photo. I might have another cousin pop in and say, no, I know for sure that wasn't the right one and here's why I know that. And that goes back to the point about crowdsourcing stories. So over here is one of my favorite bits. This is Google Street View. So Google Street View lets you move around in a picture. You've all probably done this a few times. And um, I can take, if it's available on um, for a given point in the map, and you know Google Street View is not the same everywhere, you can go in and uh, copy out that sometimes really scary looking URL. Um, but it will produce, it will embed this kind of a street view. The instructions on how to do that are covered in this uh, article here, and this is why I included it. Because though you the, include any kind of content into a Ponga picture, to get what you expect sometimes requires a little bit of adjustment depending on how different sites have uh, implemented things. Here, for example, is a presentation, a PowerPoint, that is all about uh, the people uh, in the area who might have been making these ma baskets. I don't, for a fact, know this, but it's an example of a PowerPoint uh, using software called SlideShare, and I show you how to go get those links. Um, this one is it's very slow because very big PDFs can be very slow, but this is a 126-page presentation in PDF form, and the full presentation is there. You can click over and see it. It's pulling down as a PDF from somebody's uh, G drive that doesn't actually uh, have, oh, these sites can get squirrely. There we go. It's coming from the Toy Association. Um, so you can go all the way in and get to the detail of that uh, of that example. So I've given you a variety of different kinds of examples of what happens in the pictures themselves. Um, notice, remember we uploaded a picture, and up here in the gallery, a number incremented. It used to say six, and now it says seven. I also got an email when you weren't looking um, that told me I had a picture waiting in the gallery. So in this gallery, I can go over and say, Hmm, do you know who this is? Which is what that says across the top. Do you know who this is? And I see the picture. It tells me, I see the close up, what we call a reference portrait for that girl. It tells me which photo that reference portrait came from. It tells me the name of the file and how many appearances. If I uploaded a batch of photos of the same little girl, it probably at the same time, it probably would have pulled them all together and told me this one, but there are eight appearances or something like that. In this case, hit return, add the name. Oh, I just start typing a couple of characters and it looks at everyone it's ever named before and says, yep, that's it. Boom, it's named. Now when I pop over into the library, there we go. It might take sometimes a tad to upload it, to refresh. There it is. A comment has been added to this picture. Notice a date time stamped album was created here. Um, and I'm going to just say TMCC example. Okay. It was sorted automatically for me in alphabetical order. And I added the name DJ to this one, Dottie Jean, and there it is. And here I see these other pictures of Dottie Jean. Oh, look at that. She was the same girl that was in that picture. That picture was shared with me. It's not going to appear the same way. Um, so in all those ways, it's going in and collecting pictures. It will not only, if you upload a batch of 50 pictures of her, it would put them all together and present them if she is with a high degree of confidence, the same person in all of those pictures. And we use a pretty high standard for that. So a little girl like this, we would not associate with her um, as she was as an elderly woman. Um, here she is the same, oops, takes a second to refresh. There we go. It's the same woman. This picture I have of her as a reference portrait is of her as a younger woman. I can also go in and modify that. And I want to say, for example, instead of calling her DJ, let's call her Dottie Jean, which is what her husband always called her. So as I do make that change, um, every photo of her is up updated. 
see Dottie Jean, um, and the label of her in um, down here is also updated when I click on that. So in each of these kinds of pictures, I have ways um, to do all that, the flexibility to do it. The one thing I haven't shown you um, is how to share. So if I take this picture, um, oh, and I haven't shown you, oh, I have shown you some of adding comments. I would have added a comment in here. This might have been their home in Abilene. Let's check the address, for example. Or, oh wait, I'll do that. I'll also show you I can add an audio recording. I often forget to demonstrate in recording because it's just as simple as click a button and um, you've now got a voice recording of that. Recording. I often forget to demonstrate in recording. You get the idea. Now, the important thing about all of the content that I add to Ponga Pictures is that it is all retained in its original standards-based form. So if I type text, it's retained as text. If I record my voice, it's retained as a standards voice recording format used in streamed media. It's called .ogg, but it may not be a household name, but it is a standard. So if you use something like Audacity, you can absolutely edit it. To grab the file, I just download. And now that file is downloaded on my, on my computer and accessible here. All of your content, again, you own. If you want it back, we'll get it back for you. We have a, an article about can I get my stuff back um, under the same uh, tips blog that you get to here. It's also in the footer of our, uh, of our website um, at ponga.com. Now, to share a picture, all I do is go in here and um, let's see. Suzanne, you still have your microphone on, right? Do you want to drop me your email? Uh, sure. You want me to put it in the chat box? Put it in the chat box. Let's see. I can still go get to the chat box. Let's see the chat. I just switched windows. And there you are. Okay. Great. So I'm simply going to paste that in here. Now I have a little... Um, that's, it, it makes it easy for me to do those invitations for me. So I've got a little copy in here, a little note that I can include. It can include links as well as um, comments and emojis, by the way. Send invite. Now, you will receive an invitation. And by the way, since it's coming from Ponga and you don't currently have an account at Ponga, Suzanne, I happen to know this, um, it will arrive uh, probably in your updates tab. So as a good best practices, we always recommend people reach out to the people you're sharing with, talk to them, tell them what to expect, and we give you some language for how to do that. And then they'll have a much better experience knowing what to do. Because as I'm sure all of you advise your uh, less technology comfortable friends and family, be careful what you click. Um, and so you'll want to tell them that it really is you and it really is OK. And they'll get a button that says view on Ponga and off they go. I have the ability to toggle here, uh, view only or can edit. Suzanne, here we are. Uh, you're very welcome to come in and play with this one and add your own comments in time. Um, uh, my great aunt Dorothy in Abilene. She used to tell great stories, etc. So you get the idea how easy it is to add details. Um, add stories. I can add stories anyway. I can add another image here. Um, I'm going to grab from here, uh, for example, here she was with her best friends. I might, you know, I can have a recording of somewhere else that she added stories and what she said and where she did and all those kinds of things. So you get the idea of those pieces. I want to wind this up about now so that we can um, get out to questions and then I can easily pop back into these examples, for example, the quilt or whatever else, to, to, to share some more stories and more examples. How's that for a good place to, to back down and, and open it up for questions, Suzanne? That sounds great. Um, so, class, please unmute your microphone and ask any questions you have. And while Hi. I'm waiting, oh, go ahead. Hi, Dave. A couple questions. Um, storage. Um, 
So um, let me explain a little bit. So some of us are genealogists and some of our kids, most of my kids probably won't be. Um, so they won't be interested, but future generations can, can future, say my grandkids, if my grandkids were interested, is there, how could they join, obtain access to my info, uh, have these records, or you're, could they not? Are you asking about the sort of legacy question after right. you're gone? Yes, right. that's, a, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we're a small startup. So it is always hard to say that, well, of course, we'll have this thing. Um, we have all come into it. We all four of us as co-founders are of a certain age where we have our own aging parents and our own adult children. Um, we totally appreciate that perspective of, shall we say, the second half of life where you are looking at what comes after me. While we don't have it in place yet, we are working on a um, uh, the legal documents to make it um, valid for you to be transferring the ownership of your account on your passing and providing the interface elements for you to identify a beneficiary so that it can be passed uh, with your assets. Um, and we think that's important for everyone, not only um, just not just something that we want ourselves. And, you know, in the world of COVID, we were just chatting amongst ourselves and my team this morning where three of us have loved ones in care homes and all three care homes have been hit with COVID. Um, so, you know, the reality of this virus has reminded all of us of the how, how, how short life is and how important it is to pass those stories and to make sure that there's nothing that gets in the way of doing that. As a startup, we have to prioritize features to get done. And um, so that is in our queue and it is something very important to us. Uh, we focused first, of course, on the, the preservation of the files and you know those kinds of very basics of the company. Is that sure, a good um, enough answer? Um, yeah, sure, a little comment. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, I guess a checkbox at the bottom that would say uh, pass to specific people or yeah. pass to anybody within oh. my generations that can prove that they are of, of me would be great. A second a, question. Yeah, um, good insight. Broken URLs. Uh -huh. How do you handle broken URLs? Great point. Great point. And that's part of Thank you for catching that very important point of subtlety. Um, being dependent on or actually relying on any kind of external content means that you are at risk of broken URLs because not everybody's going to have the attitude of the Library of Congress with a permalink, for example. Um, so we warn people about that. If you have a broken URL, when you open the content in Ponga, you will see the URL um, and it won't embed. It, it won't have been, it won't come in. It doesn't look particularly ugly, it's just blank. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I mentioned permanent.org because for example, if you can be searching up articles, uh, documents, uh, photos, videos, home movies is a great category from all over the web that you own, that you possess or that you have found and, and had a downloadable uh, rights to be able to collect, you can put those into your archive over at permanent.org. Then you're linking there, and that's where your assurances are of, of reliable content. Um, okay. As with all things, all things internet, part of the um, part of what makes this work is the distributed nature of it. The distributed nature of it means you don't have that control. Yeah, so, many URLs are just temporary. I guess you don't at this time. You wouldn't at this time notify somebody that they had a broken URL. It would just so they could correct it, but it would just show up when they tried to access. It. That is correct. And um, as software, uh, we certainly could know as you're opening the image. It does create a lot of technology overhead to be continuously checking all URLs sure. and all pictures to see if anything has broken. Um, it's an interesting feature. Um, yeah, sure. You know. what, one last comment, not particularly for you, but for everybody. I'm a genealogist and I do 
SAR applications and other applications for other societies. Uh -huh. And uh, what I always get from the national organization is, well, that book is real nice, but it's not sourced. So I would say exactly. anybody that's writing a book, if you got, if you have sources, put them in somewhere. Thank you. Uh, you uh, know, that's, that's a great point, Dave. And that's where, you know, I look at this treasure that I inherited from my genealogist mother, grandmother, and her amateur photographer husband, who was the one who took that picture that I use so often as an example. And this book is wonderful. But at the end of the day, it's just a, it's a, it's a low resolution map because there's none of the none of the source materials. And I would just love, to, that's a lifetime to go through and collect all of the original, rediscover the original source documents. I would put them in, into an archive in permanent.org and then start using those kinds of documents to um, find those stories in the photographs. I happen to have a remarkable collection of photographs, again, because he was a shutterbug in, you know, he was born in, in 18, uh, 1864 and lived in 1955. So he just went through this remarkable period of time and, uh, and was a shutterbug of means. So it's a privilege and now it's a, now it's a responsibility. Other questions? So as I, oh, go ahead. Um, I have a cassette recording of our wedding ceremony. Is there a way to attach it to my wedding photograph? Absolutely. So that's a great example. Um, you'll have a cassette tape or reel-to-reel -reel or any other kind of recorded media. Remember DAT tapes? Um, and there are a remarkable network of, of di local digitizing houses, professionals that in every community that can help you digitize that media. I'm afraid I don't know in the Reno area. Um, there's a wonderful uh, resource that we work with as a partner of ours at uh, Larson Digital in the Salt Lake area. And they certainly do that kind of thing. So what you would get back, you would give them the tape and you would get back probably an MP3 file, um, which again is a standards-based format, and you could park that in a safe place. Again, this is where um, uh, this is where permanent.org is a good solution. Uh, SoundCloud, uh, it, you know, is sort of targeted to a different market. They just happen to have a that market is very lucrative, so it happens to have supported the um, very nice interface to be able to load there and then link to that because you can create a customized uh, thumbnail essentially as the audio plays. That was the example that I gave um, earlier of the of a podcast. I have an example of my co-founder's daughter playing Claire de Lune in uh, the picture that I um, also sh that I often share with people. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility ability and how you do that. You can even use something like SoundCloud to present it, but still keep the backup over at um, over at permanent.org. So you've got the dual places to reference it. And you can paste links into Ponga all day long. Ponga doesn't mind. Um, so you can keep multiple links in there and control which one previews. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Sure. It's a great question. So while other people are thinking about questions to ask. Um, I have a, a absolute um, genuine offer for all of you, two, uh, several actually. Let's start with one thing, is that if you'd like to explore the, um, what I call the, uh, let me share my screen here for a second. Um, there it is. If you'd like to explore this picture uh, yourselves, um, uh, Audi up here. You see, I can't reshare it because I'm looking at an account that is not Audi, so I can't reshare it with you, and I wouldn't open it anyway because you would see the email addresses. We think those kinds of things are really important and have to be kept private. I can jump over into that account and share this picture with you. Here is SoundCloud as an example, um, and you know, an audio track that happens to pick up. Um, they give you a lot of flexibility in how you do that. I'd be delighted to share this picture with you as an example. Just reach out to me in all the means that uh, Suzanne's going to give you. 
um, and I'll be happy to uh, make that uh, make that invitation. So you can explore that on your own time. That would make you my, actually Audie's guest at Ponga. It's completely free to be a guest. I also have um, an exciting event coming up on uh, Tuesday the 18th uh, where we'll be hosting uh, Lisa Listen of Are You My Cousin, a well-known uh, genealogist and blogger and author. She's going to be talking about how she has used Ponga um, with her own photos of, and how things that she has discovered in her own photos, particularly by using the facial organization features. So we'll be focusing completely on that um, at 4 o'clock Pacific time uh, on the 18th. Um, that's a webinar and you can find that under events at our homepage or at ponga.com slash um, and a link that uh, I included in the handout that Suzanne will have or will be getting you. And uh, related to that one is a companion workshop um, on the 28th. And that workshop will invite you uh, in. Uh, we're making a special offer on membership. Generally, membership is $9 a month or $99 a year. And for this workshop and the month of January, uh, for people who register in the talk or the workshop, we're giving you a chance to, to purchase it for 99 cents for the first month. And then you can explore it with all of the features for that first month. Um, and then if you come to the workshop, we'll give you a special offer on the annual subscription as well. And of course, we'll be at Roots Tech and all the usual places. I feel like I'm on a talk show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, have a, I have just kind of an observation. Um, this last weekend, I did a presentation at a local lineage society about how to self-publish your own family history book, you know, for like under $5. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the things that I pointed out in my presentation is that, you know, a lot of us have um, inherited attempts at family history books by prior generations. Sometimes they're in a photo album format. Sometimes they're a scrapbook format. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, um, you know, spiral bound, you know, technology just wasn't there, you know, right. 40, 50 years ago uh, when a lot of these books were, were handed down or, or actually done. And the one thing I pointed out in the presentation is that a lot of, you know, current generation, you know, I mean, I'm a baby boomer, but, you know, there's been several generations since then. A lot of them don't really want to have those types of, of um, materials laying around their homes anymore. Uh, you know, they're kind of aged out and, and not yeah. that attractive. Uh, and I see this product very similar to making eBooks, you know, which is one of yeah. the things I was talking about in my presentation yeah. uh, is technology allows you to capture the interest of newer generations that's exactly uh, right. rather than those old format books that were perfectly wonderful for me um, but for current you know generations uh, who are much younger than me it's just not that appealing yeah that's exactly right and and from our perspective one of the exciting things about bringing things into a digital format is that younger generations can do what they do everywhere else, right? I mean, they mark up stuff, they comment on stuff. And once it's digital, they can actually do that. You know, as you mentioned that, it never occurred to me, but you're absolutely right. I could take this book and add my own annotations to it as I go out to do that research and find where it is. And I've got the immediate cross-reference of where it is. I could do that on the PDF too, by the way. Um, uh, but pulling it all in together into photographs is where the kids are going to be more interested. Plus, by the way, you can do all of this over Zoom. It's very hard to hold up a picture like this and say, well, you, you see you see the thing she's holding there? I mean, come on, you can't see that. But I can share the picture over Zoom and then have that conversation. And oh, by the way, I can record anybody on a free account. Most people don't seem to realize this, anyone one-to-one -one on a free account on Zoom can record the whole session and then pop that somewhere like permanent or, uh, or YouTube for that matter and keep it unlisted if you want to keep it private and take the link to that and pop it into, uh, pop it into a picture. And now you've got what it was that Aunt Betty said about that thing that day in video. Um, and that's really neat. It's it's a very powerful thing. If you're uncomfortable with YouTube, that's okay. Put it somewhere 
like your own drives with your own passwords and everything else and give a link to it that then asks for all the passwords and everything else. In other words, it, from our perspective, it's not about, um, we're not trying to, to, to take that private information and make it public. It's not at all necessary. Um, you can keep all of that kind of information private, but it really goes a long way to encourage and engage that younger generation in those stories while they can still hear them live from their grandmother. I mean, it's really hard because so often we don't get interested in genealogy until we get that point where, you know, empty nesters, where our own kids are grown, or you reach a certain point in, in age, generally, not always, but certainly uh, as, a, as a whole. And yet by that time, our loved ones are unable to tell us the stories or, uh, or have sadly passed. And so we do hear a lot about how to do that. We have a course at Roots Tech, again, specifically on the mechanics of doing that Zoom, using Zoom to jump the generation gap. Um, and we think that's a really exciting way to use the software. Oh, Bill, you asked a question earlier. What are our storage limits and, oh, up, and or upload limits per member? Great question, and forgive me for not hitting this earlier. You know, uh, <clears throat> as a startup, we have to be sustainable too. So we knew that in creating something, there people are uploading their own content to us. If enough people upload everything they have, we'd go out of business because we have costs associated with doing that. So yes, we do have limits, but it's more of a budget than it is a limit. So for our monthly accounts, you can upload up to a thousand images of any any de any uh, resolution or size. Um, or up to 12,000, or sorry, up to 1,000 per month or 12,000 per year on the annual account. Above that, so if you exceed those budgets, we just charge you a little bit more at the same rate. So if you're on a, a monthly or an annual plan and you tip over that number of 1,000 or 12,000, we'll charge you basically $10 per thousand images. So it's the same kind of number, it's just a little discount at the monthly because it's a round number that we could think of as a penny a picture. Um, so does that help? Good question. And I only wish I had over 12,000 photographs, but I don't. <laughs> you know, one of the hard things is um, uh, what you have that are it, th those those precious scanned, those precious images, those prints that were handed on, passed on, um, they really do become iconic. You may not have very many of them, but I'm sure every one of them is really, really precious. I have a remarkable number of them because he was a photographer, and it turns out that I, I kept finding these large pictures, but they looked really old. And I finally realized that, no, he, he just took uh, tintype photos and put them on a, an enlarger and did a photographic copy back in the day. And, you know, it's this big because he was a home printer. Um, and that's interesting all by itself, but uh, they, they come in all sorts of different forms and the fewer you have, the more valuable each one is. But it's also an opportunity to, uh, in connecting with cousins and doing that crowdsourcing, you may well find someone else in the family network that in fact had others or, you know, related families that the pictures went that direction and never got to you. So, and photography, you know, it's a new technology. 200 years is nothing. That's why I love going back to artifacts. Well, the stories may be a little rusty, but sometimes, you know, you have even letters of, of why something was passed um, that really makes it very precious. I have a, an ex uh, coworker that I used to work with and she had a small cabinet, uh, like a, like a, a dr you know, like a dresser, like small, uh -huh. small dresser. And uh, when she pulled out one of the drawers one day when she was cleaning it, she just happened to turn it over. And there inscribed in the wood was a secret marriage of one of her ancestors that she was never aware of. Wow, and uh, there you go. so it's just it's amazing what heirlooms can right. reveal. And I, I've always just loved that story when she told it to me, because I mean, who would have ever have known? I guess it was a secret marriage that she never wanted anyone to know. Or maybe perhaps it was forbidden uh, by her parents or whatever the case might be, but she wanted it and she knew that that chest of, of drawers was going to be handed down. So she etched it into the wood. Oh, wow. That just, we call these the tingle stories, the, the stories that just send chills up your back. That's a wonderful story. A wonderful story.
Oh, we, we may talk about that one. I'd love to use that in my jamboree. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I, I, Wendy, go I, ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Wendy Gregory. And I, hi, um, I, I've been doing genealogy for a long time, but my my thing is, you know, in my, my head is just going wishy, 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 wishy. When I see all of this stuff that I can do and I just go, oh my God, where do I start? And <laughs> and then I think I, I can't even get the names and everything right in my family. Like my class knows those darn Murphys, you know, we're, we're still working on that. <laughs> but, but, but I just like, it's like, where do I start? How do I start? And I think okay, I, I'm still working. So I don't have every, you know, a lot of time to do genealogy. My, I think my husband thinks I don't ever want to come to bed, um, you know, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but it's just like, how do I, but I, what I see for me that would be helpful because I am the only heir on my dad's side that got all the family pictures. And I know there are some other, but our families weren't very big. Um, but I see the, the name recognition or the face recognition as something that could be very beneficial. Cause I sat down with my cousin who is, you know, probably 20 years older than me. And he's like, you know, of course we look on the back and we go, okay, yeah. Okay. That is right. Or we look on the back and there's nothing there and we don't know who it is. So I think the face recognition would help me with some of the pictures. Absolutely. Um, but Absolutely. Again, but I, I worry about like the, Dave was asking, it's like, how am I, if I'm doing all this work, if I'm putting all this effort into it, I want to dang will make sure that someone in the future be able, is able to get this. Right. So if I'm putting effort into it, I, I want somebody else to see it. And that's, that's right. And I just don't have very many people that are that interested now. I have teenagers and they could care less. <laughs> <laughs> well, for starters, the good news is teenagers do grow up. And um, you, ne you, you never know where those interests are going to come from. And then the discovery and genealogy work that you're also doing has you finding um, other people that are interested. And I hope my answers in terms of what we do uh, about preservation of the digital file, the digital content, and the cross-references, I hope those are meaningful for you. Quite frankly, that's what we're doing for ourselves, uh, making sure that all of this information is maintained as essentially a database of the original images and, and content in their original format and the cross-references to where they belong on the selections in an image. Um, and then giving you means like permanent.org to have make sure that the external links are going to be retained and consistent um, uh, to doing that. You asked a really good question um, with respect to where do I start and that anxiety. I totally understand that. Um, we often counsel people to really, well, you know, look at what the problem is you're trying to solve in the first place. A lot of times the first problem you have to solve is to scan the images, to, and you're wanting to do that anyway in terms of protecting them. We do have partners who are essentially in the scanning business. Uh, uh, L uh, Larson, for example, uh, is particularly integrated um, and familiar with who we are, what we're doing, and, and to help you just get that content directly into Ponga. Um, another thought that one of our members that found us, who was a fierce uh, photo book maker, she was one of these people who loved to travel, and she would go off on a trip, come back from the trip, take all of her digital photos, modern photos, um, from a trip, and then make basically scrapbooks of those pictures, then take pictures of those scrapbook pages and make a book of it. And she realized that they would just sit on the shelf and get dusty. And what she really wanted to do, she lives in Australia, and what she really wanted to do was to share them and use them to engage with her family members in Canada, where the rest of her family is. Um, and um, she found that she couldn't really do do that because, um, uh, excuse me, just a moment, please. So um, what she did was then realize that she could turn these books into Ponga albums and then share those with family as albums. So if you have books that you're already working from, you can start there. Just start with that and start telling the stories that you knew as you were putting those together and then let that 
create the cookie trail for where it takes you. Um, you'll find a lot of her stories under uh, Victoria's Press, victoriaspress.com. She's one of our very active members um, and uh, also often blogs and so on about what she's done. Okay, and that's good. And then also um, my career, I'm a fiduciary officer for a bank. And um, when we talk to people about their estate planning, um, when we talk to them about their estate planning, we uh, now are having the attorneys that are um, drafting documents for digital access uh -huh. and, and for digital access. And so, right. you that's know, so that's really important part, you know, for getting into these accounts down, right. down the line. That's and, exactly the kind of expertise that we're pulling in. We're not doing this kind of stuff ourselves. We're bringing yeah. in the professionals to make sure that we've got that covered correctly. Yeah, yeah. and, and it, so, it's, so it's nice on the professional side to get that background to do it, but also telling your clients. So like, you know, like, so when I'm talking to clients, you know, yes, you know, share your information about the spe specific jewelry your grandma bought in Alaska, yeah. but also tell your family that there's, you know, when you're doing your list of assets, you need to show that you also have these digital accounts and it could be numerous. And so that's right. It's new, I've been doing this for 30 years and it's new. It's new stuff for us to add to and bitcoins yeah. and, you know, those kind yeah. of assets. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah. Thank that's you. A, that's a terrific. That's a terrific insight. And in fact, the the process sometimes it's uh it's ghoulish to go through your or it feels icky to go through your uh, assets as if you're in your delicate sixties going through all your stuff saying which kid's going to get what. It just doesn't feel right. Um, but to go through each of these objects in your sixties photographing them carefully and telling the stories. And oh, by the way, incidentally, in the process, because you were taking the time to do that, you are making that list of assets. And, you know, by the way, Wendy, I'd love to see a blog post about that. Just, hey, here's something to keep in mind. Here's something to do. Here's a way to do it. If only I knew professionals in that space that know how to do that. I'm Barbara at Ponga. Reach out to me. I'd love to chat. We have um, many guest speakers, guest bloggers on our blog for precisely that reason. We use a medium as the back end of that so that you contain your control, your byline um, for blog posts. And that way we can bring in professional voices to tell those stories and go about that. So right. Well, we have a insight. couple of good we have a couple of good, really good attorneys that deal with digital, also bitcoins, things like that. But they all I'll, say, I'll, I'll send you a link between Terrific. the two of you. And Thank I don't you know, so much. I'd be interested in it. But. We, we have our own attorneys that are, you know, the, co the corporate attorneys, but that specific insight, there may be ways that we can work together to do that. And, and there's you know, probably some, some additional expertise that you've got there that their, their corporate work doesn't cover. So, Well, you, you know, there's such thing as dog trusts, so maybe there could be genealogy record trusts. Hasn't that somebody per, thought of that? Yeah. No, I just thought of it now. <laughs> well, there's the blog post. Let's make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Lovely right, to thanks, meet you, Barbara. Wendy. Just reach thanks. out. Yeah. Anything else? I'll let the class give it just a few seconds. You know what? Um, just a, a few things, Barbara. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, old recordings, like on cassette tape and reel to reel, and uh, those old formats. Yeah. Um, there are I, I've seen, and I don't know how good the quality is, but I have seen advertisements on eBay and Amazon for uh, relatively inexpensive devices that you can buy, where you can just insert your cassette tape. And it converts it into MP3. But like I said, I don't know the quality of the uh, the sound quality. Yeah, I um, think. But, it, but if it's on cassette, it's probably not going to be great quality anyhow, because most cassettes right. are what at least twenty right. years old. Quite, I, I think you know, as with most things, you're going to make a um, you're going to there there is a spectrum here. On one hand is uh, cost because it's real. And on the other is how fragile is the material, the original material. And using a very cheap device to just grab that digital may damage the original artifact. And you don't want to do that. And my general advice is if it's very fragile and very important and um, 
it's probably worth pulling in the advice of a professional, and maybe not at the very tippy top, but somewhere in that professional line to go through and do that digitizing for you. If it's some cheap little thing and you just kind of thought it was fun, well, then no worries. Or you've got multiple copies of it, no worries. And I'll give you a for instance. Um, again, my amateur photographer great -grand or grandfather um, was taking color pictures in the early 30s. I have a picture of uh, my grandmother with my mother sitting on her lap. And I can tell, because I know when my mother was born in 1929, this picture, I'm not sure if I have it right handy. Um, uh, this picture, oh, I don't, uh, must have been taken in about 1932. It's color. Kodachrome didn't come out until 38 or something. So this is home color on a slide, a lantern glass slide. They're very rare, and um, they existed, by the way, back to the 19th century, so it's not like a museum piece. Um, and, but I wanted to get it scanned as high a resolution as I could. I went to a local, you know, the kind of photographer that does, or photo studio, developing studio, that does work for advertising agencies and artists and people like that. And they scanned it for me and gave me like an 80 meg file, a JPEG, uh, TIFF file, 80 meg TIFF file and uh, gave me all of the you know originals in perfect form, of course. And it was probably around $30, something like that, to scan that one image. But from my perspective, totally worth it. I don't even remember how much it was. It could have been $50. From my perspective, for that image, it was totally worth it. And um, you know, it just sort of depends on how you take each of those kinds of things and how fragile they are. I do caution you on tape. Maybe not so much cassette, depending on how old, you know, 1970s mixtapes. That could be really fun. Um, and it might be worth a good use of testing some equipment. Um, but a 1969 voice of your great grandmother, and there's only one copy, I don't know. I, I'd be really worried about risking that. Well, that kind of brings me to thinking something else about negatives. You know, I, I, I have. Unfortunately, um, you know, like I guess a lot of people when when the parents have all the family photos and as each child of theirs gets married, they kind of divvy up the photos between the yeah. children as they get married and leave home. Yeah. And uh, so I unfortunately um, uh, did not get all the photographs, you know, because they were divvied out to my brothers as as they got older and got married and left home. Uh, but I did inherit all the negatives. <laughs> ah. So um, once again, there's a quandary about converting those negatives uh, into something. Now, I have seen apps um, on Facebook. I've seen advertisements for uh, apps that you can download onto your cell phone that will convert a negative into a positive. But how does Panga do anything with that? No, you know, from our perspective, the market for photo restoration, uh, photo scanning, photo retouching, and so on is so rich, uh, so sophisticated, and there's so many different alternatives out there we, that we just figured, that why should we try to reproduce what's already well done in the market? We'd have to be as good as anything else in the market and then constantly chasing that path, and we couldn't do this thing that's very different. So, no, we don't do that at all ourselves. Um, and in fact, especially the scanning part, there are, again, those kinds of people are partners of ours. So you can take your negatives, a stack of negatives, to uh, any local scanning company. If they've never heard of Pongo, you're welcome to introduce us to them. Um, but I mentioned people like uh, Larson or um, a lot of small local, uh, high quality local scanning uh, companies will do that kind of thing. Scanning negatives from a home flat panel, uh, you know, a home scanning device is not hard or expensive. So I bought a an Epson flatbed scanner for about 250 less than $300 um, uh, to do slides, actually. In my family, it was all slides, color positive slides. Um, but the negative is the same difference. And um, it has little inserts that you slip in there, you know, bloop, and do a whole bunch of them at a time. It's just time consuming. If you want to give a high school or middle school kid a job, make them do it. Um, have the lots of storage and, um, you know, you set up a routine for getting it done uh, with care and um, good hygiene for dust and stuff like that. You can absolutely do that yourself with minimal risk to damaging the files themselves, um, you know, 
care with things like white gloves and that sort of stuff is important, but it can absolutely be done. Is it okay to take pictures with your camera? Absolutely. It's okay to do anything you want to do, <clears throat> except damage the, you know, except lie and damage and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so using, I use, uh, you know, I bought myself a fairly fancy new iPhone primarily so that I could take pictures of, of things. I use it to scan documents all the time. And that's really, really useful. Um, so if that's your only option and it's not terribly important that it be perfect, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Just get it done. And that's how I go about most of this stuff. One of our members was telling us a story about how her family of very modest means, her grandparents had just a handful of photographs from their uh, so it was great grandparents. They were hanging on her grandmother's wall, and she used to see them all the time when she went to visit her grandmother. And when she inherited them, she is today a photo organizer, a professional, really a professional archivist working for others with substantial image collections. And she realized that the little dots on the images were bird poop because <laughs> she had the pet pigeons or something that would just be you know, parakeets or something like that near the birds. The fact that the pictures were damaged in this way added to the story for her. And it's important to remember, it's not about being perfect. It's about passing on the values, passing on the stories. It's often what's invisible in a photograph that's the most important thing. I look at that picture I was sharing of kind of that outdoor picnic and realize well, one of the most important things to me is who was taking the picture. And he's not in the picture, but I can tell who it was. It had to be my grandfather because he's not, he's, my grandmother's looking right at him. And she's obviously a young bride with a first baby and all those kinds of things. So that's my advice on that. Hello, I have a, a question. Sure. Uh, uh, since facial recognition is um, a, a fundamental part of your software, um, there's been a lot of discussion of how it uh, does not include minorities eff um, effectively. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've all heard the stories of congressmen uh, oh, yeah. who go unrecognized by right. the government's AI. Right. So with what confidence do you have that your software applies to uh, minorities that may seek that's, to use your, your program? Sure. That's a terrific question. And thanks so much for asking that. Um, AI, or rather, well, AI as a whole, but certainly facial recognition as a whole uh, has a lot of people concerned, quite frankly, including us. Um, you'll find that we don't talk about our software as facial recognition. We talk about doing face detection and collection for the purpose of facial organization. We don't talk about facial recognition because in most people's mind, that means that you're taking my collection of pictures and you're comparing it to some external database of faces <clears throat> and then making matches. We don't do that. There, we don't look up any external database. You bring in your pictures. We look through every image using the technology, the, the essentially algorithms of facial recognition technology to, exa to examine every image, detect faces, collect those that appear to be the same person, and put them in front of you to name. Then, when you upload more pictures that we have a very high degree of confidence is the same as one of the pictures you already uploaded, then we will recognize it. That is technically recognizing and put them together and put them in your, in your um, albums and so on. With respect to people of color, both um, uh, of, uh, just a, a range of the human face in all over the planet, from our perspective, the technology to detect faces and recognize them in our system is tuned so high that you do risk getting smudges and, um, you know, uh, folds in curtains or faces in photos that happen to be on the wall. That kind of thing will get picked up as a face and you will have to 
go through those. They will typically only appear as one instance of it. It'll be at the end of your, uh, your uh, row, your gallery row to put names to. Um, and you just ignore. You noticed when I went through the gallery, we gave you three buttons to uh, add a name, to skip, or ignore. So people at the next table, you would just ignore. Smudges on the wall, you would ignore. Do we detect a face that is Asian? Do we detect a face that is African American or African or um, any other part of the world? Absolutely we do. Um, one of the things that's especially important uh, with respect to the, the, the controversy of facial recognition is its use in law enforcement. So if it's going to be inaccurate in matching this person is that person, and then you're applying uh, the full factor of the law to put someone in jail as the basis of that match, that's a very bad thing. Um, and we certainly uh, do not support that in any way whatsoever. And, and uh, policies like we have in San Francisco um, and much in California of, of banishing um, law enforcement from using facial recognition, we have no problem with at all. We think that uh, it can be very, very bad. Um, but what we are doing is using it entirely private. The data, by the way, of the facial geometries that are used to figure out is this person that person. That data, we are also keeping private. So we're not sharing that data anywhere. Your data is your data. Um, so that's also uh, important. Um, there were of some bad actors in the market in the past who were collecting consumer photos and making a very free kind of photo service, and then basically just using those photos to train their facial recognition tools to then turn around and sell to law enforcement. No, we don't do that at all. We are, uh, it, it, that's antithetical to what, how we go about this. Our goal is to use these tools for the purpose of organization of your photos so that you can use them to tell your stories. I hope that's helpful. I think that kind of comes down to the DNA uh, gen match argument that has been so commonly spoken of here in our class. Um, so what would happen if you should get a subpoena? Uh, well, we would we um, would follow the law, taking the default assumption of privacy in every step possible. Um, so what would happen if I get a subpoena? It sort of depends. We have, for example, usage rules. Our, if you go to our terms of service, um, there is, and our privacy policy are all on our website, along with our terms, uh, uh, our usage rules. Usage rules specify, for example, that you're, you're not going to be using um, Ponga for basically naughty picture sharing, that kind of thing. Um, and our, our usage rules give us the ability to say, yeah, no, no not here, go away. Um, and uh, uh, we don't have your private, your private pictures are your private pictures. I can't see any of our customers' pictures. I can see a thumbnail that gives us enough information plus our algorithms that can detect inappropriate, uh, inappropriate use. Um, if a law enforcement thinks that we're hiding a cell of terrorists that are using our, there's lots of what ifs. Um, to, you know, which way we would go. We have a strong DNA of uh, privacy and show me a warrant uh, kind of attitude, and that's our general principle. Is that helpful? I, I, yeah, absolutely. I think this is just something that with all electronic accounts, we're all concerned of. I think absolutely. nobody much thought about it until GEDmatch. Yeah. You know, when right. GEDmatch happened, all of a sudden, it's yeah. on everyone's mind. That's right. And I hope that all of you are aware of the fine work of the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, on issues like this as they relate to privacy. Um, and that's uh, been generally the guidance that we take. Wonderful. Um, did you want to continue on with your slideshow? Um, those were the, I, that beginning was the portion that I wanted to be sharing with all of you, um, and I think that gives you, I don't want to wear out my welcome, that gives you the highlight of where we're going. 
in the handout, <clears throat> I included references to the courses that we're giving at uh, Roots Tech coming up in March. Um, the course about using Ponga together with permanent.org and the course that we're giving on um, using uh, Zoom with Ponga to do screen sharing with family. Uh, we have a couple of use cases in that one. One is one-on-one -on -one to get someone's feedback of what was the story behind this picture. But also um, for uh, that family member who may not be able to participate themselves directly in a conversation with a big group, which can be hard for those who have cognitive impairments, um, but to be able to uh, participate by ga taking a gathering of family and friends, then recording that and giving it to them on, say, an iPad. Um, it's a wonderful way to capture those stories and share them with a loved one so that they can feel it um, and, and, and share that love as it's related to their family stories. So we've got, you know, the procedures and directions on how to do that. I wanted to make sure that all of you got that high level view of where we're going. We're now opening up to be available to genealogy communities all over the country, all over the world, actually. We did a uh, The Genealogy Show UK back in December, um, and we'll do that a couple more times this year in April and I think June. Um, and uh, is a way to get to know different kinds of genealogy communities. And uh, now have some of our members starting to do speaking uh, arrangements and show off the software as well. So we're thrilled by that. Well, wonderful, Barbara. Um, let me just give the class one last chance to ask any questions they have. We'll just give it a few moments. So it's Wendy again. Sure. So if we, want, if we wanted to just like do a test run practice, you said, what would, what do we need to do? Just... There's a couple ways to do it. One, completely free, is drop me your email address. Drop me an email at barbara at polka.com. And I think that's in the, um, uh, in the email, in the um, uh, handout that you have, Suzanne. Also, there's a chat bot at polka.com. Um, I'm honestly the other voice of Audi at the chat bot. So you can also pop over there um, and ask for an invitation. Ask to explore that picture, and I will send you an invitation to be my guest or Audie's guest at, at that picture, to explore it on your own time. That'll also give you that sort of jumble picture of a stuff on a, on a counter so you can play with it. Now, if you think you'd like to play with it with your own pictures, we have this special opportunity in January to do that, which is to sign up for our webinar on Tuesday. Uh, we'll send you a promo code as well as, of course, participation in the webinar. And then we have a workshop in the end of January where we'll bring everybody together that has been playing with the software themselves to walk through specific focus on using the facial organization features. Barbara, do you mind uh, sharing your screen and showing them the, the website, showing them how to register for those webinars? Oh. Sure, silly me. I should have thought of that. You've got a future here in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so, ponga.com. So this is the uh, Ponga homepage that walks through the features. And right there, in fact, is the pop-up for registering. We're also here behind the Live Events button. Uh, either button takes you to the same place which is where you register for the webinar. We have videos of that. Um, when of we that, research. Okay, that, you know who that is now. Um, uh, that, that go through the details of it. We're also on YouTube with, um, uh, with uh, you know, how-tos of all sorts. We're in a whole lot of the social media, primarily Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter most actively probably, uh, and then of course, of course, big videos we're posting out to uh, it, to YouTube. Um, and a lot of the work that we're doing here in January and February is experimenting to see what works, what is uh, what is a way that people can experiment and, and learn how to use the software um, ahead of Roots Tech in, uh, in March, which we expect to just do whatever's working, do more of that because Hey, startup life. Wonderful. Well, I encourage everyone in the class to register for these uh, two free classes. This is wonderful. The timing's uh, great. That's why I wanted to do this right away when you just knocked on our door and 
kudos to you, Suzanne. It has been such a delight to get to know you and your community. Um, uh, I'm thrilled by what you're doing around the country. We do see a few little cells of excellence like this with these kinds of creative programs that are creating a way under COVID to just reach out places you're not otherwise reaching. And frankly, I think that tremendously enriches the work in the physical library and reminding people why they're part of a community. A community isn't just a place anymore. It's, um, it becomes this kind of virtual space. Absolutely. COVID has, has closed many doors, but opened many more. That's right. That's right. So, so down here at the footer of our email, of our um, website, you'll find the rest of these kinds of links I was referring to as well. Okay, wonderful. Now I think about it. <laughs> okay, so if the class has no further questions, um, before you sign off, uh, Susan, I want to say thank you very much. It's been wonderful. And I hope, like I said, everyone in the class registers for your upcoming webinars. Thank and you. Um, if you'd like to stay for the second half of the class, you're more than welcome to.